Have you asked yourself if you understand your perception of the world? As humans, we ask so many questions to gain understanding of our existence and the space around us. This very trait of ours is exactly why we place ourselves so high on the pedestal of the evolutionary tree. Now the problem is, while we reflect on this accolade of our humanity, we ignore the animalistic traits and deeply ingrained mannerisms that came from evolution itself. In our goals to increase logical coherency with science and philosophy, the facts and the remnants of our evolution are ignored. Now this hubris that we carry brings us closer to an illusion of coherency in our belief systems instead of true logical consistency and progression. To understand this, we'll reference the book Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow by Daniel Kahneman. The book is a truly revolutionary and humbling outlook on the dominant programs of our behavioral systems. We'll explore how we can understand and be aware of these concepts so that our belief systems are grounded and we can align our actions with them. We want to be able to avoid biases like cognitive dissonance which can be very frustrating and embarrassing once discovered in ourselves. Let's introduce the two systems of thinking as the author plainly describes as one and two. Paraphrasing from the book, system one operates automatically, quickly, with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control for functions such as walking at a leisurely pace, recognizing objects, avoiding losses, and fearing spiders. System two is utilized for intentional cognitive processes like calculating a difficult equation or focusing on a new or hard task. In these situations, you must use a considerable amount of focus or the task will not be possible. Before we go further, let's explore a simple scenario to demonstrate the systems. You're at the supermarket with a friend looking for cleaning products and recently you've become more environmentally conscious. So you're looking for sustainable products, you explain to your friend. You say luckily, these days those brands are clearly labeled. Your friend who has recently read the book we're discussing at the moment is quite skeptical. And knowing that you're a bit of an intellect yourself, having read many books on biases and heuristics, claims that your reasoning sounds like a simple confirmation bias. Once you've made your selection, they pick up an identical container and start examining the distinct green and brown packaging, especially scrutinizing the new sustainable formula branding. Slowly meeting your eyes after the examination, they ask you, how do you know this is sustainable? Because it says so on the packet. This is the sustainable brand eco-wise. All of their products are sustainable. I always buy them. Not giving you room to breathe, they remark, apart from the obvious marketing ploys that the company has chosen, how do you know that this is actually different from the other products? You feel a cold chill as the coherence of your system one thinking begins to crumble and it scrambles at the most recent point of relevance to an answer. You say, I think I remember seeing a study online that said this brand was the most sustainable out of the others in comparison. Tightening the grasp on your fractured logic, she barks. So you don't actually know anything specific. You're basing your beliefs on a marketing ploy when these companies have the only interest in taking your money and a study that you can barely recall seeing. The coherent story that your system one thinking created in your mind gives in and snaps and your system two is hot and ready to go. You grab the laundry powder, arms tensed and pupils wide. You start frantically looking at the description of the product at the back, hunting for something relevant to the sustainability of the product. You instantly scan for the words, we care about the environment so, and then skip down a few more sentences and it continues, we've developed a new formulation that is kinder to the planet. The sentence ends there and the icy shakes that you felt earlier melts into a salty coat of nervousness. Your system too doesn't fail you yet though. It scans for the next buzzword and it meets and fails at this packaging is recyclable. Devastated, your pupils shrink and the system too leaves the chat. You've reached your wits end and rage overcomes you as you say, at least I'm actually trying to do something for the environment. What have you done recently? You never even try to buy sustainable products. You eat meat for Christ's sake. It's literally the biggest thing affecting the environment at the moment. Your friend snaps the last thread that you were hanging on to and calmly replies, you know you eat dairy products. The meat that I eat literally comes from the industry that you support. Even though you say you're vegetarian, you're literally paying for the cows that I'm eating. All right, let's stop it there. I think you have a decent idea about how these two systems work. There were some key concepts described in the book that I showed over the text while I was running through the dialogue. Let's reference the book and go a bit more in depth to understand how that person was thinking at the time. The first bias that we see arise from system one is confirmation bias. 
And we see it play out when we say things like, it's sustainable because it says so on the packet or that we trust the brand. Confirmation bias is a widely known concept and is not really specific to this book. However, basically it's a form of interpretation where you only seek to find evidence that affirms your beliefs that you already have. On to the next one being relevancy bias. This bias played out when we said, I think I remember seeing the study about sustainability. Kahneman describes, anything that makes it easier for the associative machine to run smoothly will also bias beliefs. A reliable way to make people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition, because familiarity is not easily distinguished from the truth. Authoritarian institutions and marketers have always known this fact, but it was psychologists who discovered that you do not have to repeat an entire statement or fact or idea to make it appear true. The familiarity of a phrase in a statement makes the whole statement feel true. So in summary, the frequency in which we see or hear something to be claimed as the truth draws us closer to actually believing those things to be true without any tangible evidence. By the time we grabbed the product, cognitive ease was tipped over and we got frustrated. Again, Kahneman describes, mood evidently affects the operation of system one. A happy mood loosens the control of system two over performance when in a good mood, people become more intuitive and more creative, but also less vigilant and more prone to logical errors. So basically, once we become trapped in this concept of cognitive ease, we go through a terrible, long, stretched out feeling of dissonance before we accept our lack of rationality. Now that we've glossed over these concepts, let me give you a real demonstration of this. In this example that I'm about to show you, I take someone's initial system one responses and ask them questions to engage their system two. All of the questions I ask are seeking to find coherence in their story that they're telling me. But you will see, once that coherence starts to crumble after having to answer these questions, so too does their rationality, unfortunately. I'm giving you this example because it's always easier to see these flaws in others, but it's very important to remember that we should look at ourselves after becoming aware of these biases. We need to do the hard task of questioning our own beliefs so that we're not causing harm to others within them. Do you think they should or shouldn't? Like, for, shouldn't be abused? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so what is it about animals that makes you feel like they shouldn't be abused? You know, if I get pinched, it hurts. Yeah. Hurt for them as well. Yeah. I guess it's like the same capacity to suffer just like us. Yeah. yeah exactly. And do you think that applies to all animals? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. And like, would you say that you're against animal abuse yourself? Uh, yeah, to an extent, yeah. yeah. To an extent? Yeah, yeah. With that, do you think that uh, there are certain cases where animal abuse is justified? Not really. Like, <laughs> when you talk about the word abuse, it's like, um, you know, just treating something like um, unfairly and unjustly and like... Um, yeah. I'm just talking about a basic uh, sense of justice and rights. Just uh, be free, have uh, bodily autonomy, not be killed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you think uh, this industry here is? Well, obviously the animal um, meat industry. Animal agriculture, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm also showing footage of egg farming, dairy, fur, animal testing, etc. Are you against all of those forms of exploitation? Or? Yeah, no, I don't agree with that. You don't agree with it? Okay. Being against uh, animal abuse and disagreeing with the sign, what do you think you can do about it as an individual if you don't want to support these industries? Well, you know, if you see it happening, then say something against it. Yep. If you see it happening. Well, know. the thing is, you'll never see these things. All of these places are behind closed walls. When you go into the supermarket, you will never see the suffering yeah, of the animals. When we shop at the supermarket, we'll always buy the, uh, the free range. Like, obviously, once the animals get to the slaughterhouse, they don't care if it's free range or not. But also, the definition of free range. What is it in your head? They're not caged. caged. Not caged? Yeah. yeah. What uh, free range legally means in New Zealand, for chickens especially, they can be in a barn. They would have no more space than they would have if they were caged as well. Do you think that's a life that's free of suffering? So those labels are put there to make you feel better about purchasing a product of animal abuse. It's not put there to make the animals feel better, right? You're a free range animal, you're still going to get sent to the slaughterhouse. Basically, this issue here is created by supply and demand, right? Yeah. So what I'm out here doing is talking to the causes of it, the consumers, right? Consumers are the problem, so consumers need to create the solution as well. The solution, first and foremost, is to boycott these industries that are abusing animals, and then the companies will take action to produce other things if they get boycotted. Because obviously, at the end of the day, all they want to do is make money, right? Yeah. Yeah. They don't care how they produce that money. But if people keep on buying animal products, then there's no reason for them to stop, is there? Yeah, so it's not a company issue. If I write a petition saying, why are you killing the calves 
from the dairy industry as soon as they're born, they're not going to stop if people don't stop supporting the industry, right? So it's a consumer-made problem with a consumer-made solution, and that's exactly why I'm out here, educating the public on industries that abuse animals. Do you think that we should eat puppies? No. Why not? Do you think that everybody shouldn't eat puppies? <laughs> and like you said before, they suffer exactly the same as us. So why would we say that about one animal and not the other? And if you truly are against animal abuse, do you think that you could say that while supporting industries that abuse animals? No, right? Yeah, and it applies to all animals, not just uh, the pets we see. I'm only focusing on people who do care about animals and people like you who do think they shouldn't be abused to align their beliefs with their actions. Because at the moment, do you think your actions reflect someone who disagrees with animal abuse? No. No, yeah. And it's as simple as... I mean, yeah, I think the first step would be to stop supporting it in the first place, right? Because... Um, no, no, just to be vegan in the first place. I'm talking about issues of injustice here. Right? If I were to be a sexist and say to people, why are you discriminating against women? It wouldn't make sense for me to do, right? No, but... Yeah, and the same applies. If you're against animal abuse and your solution is to continue to pay for it while telling other people to stop it, it doesn't make sense, right? There's no... Uh... No, no, I just, yeah. Yeah, I just can't, can't do vegan Personally. Well, that and just means just that you don't understand it, one, or that you're pretty much saying that you can't be against animal abuse. Because so that's all that veganism means. Do you think you want me to do to like... The first step for everyone is to practice what you preach and literally go vegan. Because if you are against animal abuse, no, even vegetarians then have to be vegan. vegetarians don't do anything for animals at all. Because what do you think happens to the cows? Yeah. No puppies, no dolphins, no cats. Like you said, you wouldn't need a puppy, but that's like a selective thing. Right? They're like, yeah, some animals don't deserve to be abused, but some do. Like that's kind of the viewpoint you have at the moment. I just think a vegan is too extreme for me. Do you think that supporting animal abuse is less extreme than not supporting animal abuse? Trying to support animal abuse, but we don't support animal abuse. Like, well, that, we that, that means you have a misconception on what veganism means because veganism only means that you're truly against animal abuse. It's got nothing to do with your personal well, health or anything. I can be a vegan, but I'm not because because you. Abuse. Well, that's impossible. That's impossible. And if you truly are against animal abuse, do you think that you could say that while supporting industries that abuse animals? No, right. Yeah, and it applies to all animals, not just uh, the pets we see. Because at the moment, do you think your actions reflect someone who disagrees with animal abuse? No. No, yeah.